crafts and industries economic impact of british rule in india the british conquest of india differed from every previous conquest in that while earlier foreign conquerors left the traditional economy virtually untouched the british imperialism broke down the whole framework of indian society and economy before the introduction of modern and mechanized methods of production by the british it was mainly cottage industry that flourished in the country the village artisans such as the weavers the carpenters and the potters met the various needs of the people they produced coarse cloth various kinds of implements and domestic vessels on a small scale for rough and ready use they inherited these occupations running in the family for generations the town artisans and craftsmen were often patronized by the local rulers nobles and landlords to produce luxury goods but with the coming of the east india company things started changing from 1600 to 1757 the east india company's role in india was that of a trading corporation which brought goods or precious metals into india and exchanged them for indian goods like textiles and spices which is sold abroad its profit came primarily from the sale of indian goods abroad naturally it tried constantly to open new markets for indian goods in britain and other countries thereby it increased the export of indian goods and thus encouraged their production this is the reason why indian rulers tolerated and even encouraged the establishment of the company's factories in india but since the beginning the british manufacturers were jealous of the popularity that indian textiles enjoyed in britain they put pressure on their government to restrict and prohibit the sale of indian goods in england several laws were passed to curb the sale of indian goods in england in spite of all these indian silk and cotton textiles still held their own in foreign markets until the middle of the 18th century when the english textile industry began to develop on the basis of new and advanced technology decline of village industries and town handicrafts the principal measures taken by the british to bring about the collapse of indian handicrafts are the forcing of british free trade on india imposing heavy duties on indian manufacturers in england the export of raw products from india the transit and custom duties granting special privileges to the british in india building railways in india compelling indian artisans to divulge their trade secrets holding of exhibitions commercial policy of the british the economic policy of the british government in india proved disastrous for the indian people after 1757 the pattern of the company's commercial and economic relations with india underwent a qualitative change after defeating the nawab of bengal in the battle of plassey in 1757 and after the battle of buxar the company could now use its political control over bengal to acquire monopolistic control over indian trade and production and to push its indian trade moreover it began to utilize the revenues of bengal to finance its export of indian goods the indian merchants were gradually squeezed out while the weavers and other craftsmen were compelled either to sell their products at uneconomic rates or to hire themselves out to the company at low wages the industrial revolution in britain completely transformed britain's economy and its economic relations with india during the second half of the 18th century and the first few decades of the 19th century britain underwent profound social and economic transformation and british industry developed and expanded rapidly on the basis of modern machines the factory system and capitalism as a result of the industrial revolution an entirely new class of society the industrial capitalist was born this new class of society the industrial capitalists owned the factories and workers who hired themselves out as their laborers on daily wages the rise of these new powerful classes had an important impact on the british economic relations with india the interest of this class in the empire was very different 
from that of the East India Company. It did not gain from the monopolization of the export of Indian handicrafts or the direct appropriation of Indian revenues. As this class grew in number and strength and political influence, it began to attack the trade monopoly of the company. Since the profits of this class came from manufacturing and not from trading, it wanted to encourage export of its own products to India as well as the import of raw materials from India instead of the imports of manufacturing goods from India. They looked upon the East India Company to be the chief obstacle in the fulfillment of their dreams. Between 1793 and 1813, they launched a powerful campaign against the company and its commercial privileges and finally succeeded in 1813 in abolishing the company's monopoly of Indian trade. With this new event, a new phase in Britain's economic relations with India began. Agricultural India was to be made an economic colony of industrial England. The government of India now followed a policy of free trade or unrestricted entry of British goods. Indian handicrafts were exposed to the fierce and unequal competition of the machine-made products of Britain and faced extinction. India had to admit British goods free or at nominal tariff rates. The free trade imposed on India was one-sided, while the doors of India were thrown wide open to foreign goods. Indian products which could still compete with British products were subjected to heavy import duties on entry into Britain. Instead of exporting manufactured goods, India was now forced to export raw materials, which British industries needed and served as a market for British manufacturers. Thus, the commercial policy of the East India Company after 1813 was guided by the needs of the British industry. Its main aim was to transform India into a consumer of British manufacturers and supplier of raw materials. By the middle of the 19th century, British economic policy with India underwent changes. The development of its trade and industry the extended exploitation of colonies and colonial markets began to produce an unlimited accumulation of capital, which was increasingly concentrated in fewer banks, corporations, trusts and cartels. The need for investment of this capital brought about changes in the British India economic relations. After 1850, a very large amount of British capital was invested in railways, loans to the Indian government and, to a smaller extent, in tea plantations, coal mining, jute mills, shipping industry, trade and banking. India now served as an area for investment of foreign capital. Indian industries faced many problems, like the British government did not encourage those industries which were not profitable to them. The government did not give any protection to them. The railway freight charges were high. The British imposed high tariffs on Indian goods till 1930. There were no facilities for providing technical education, which was required for industrial growth. The British government did not encourage the development of heavy industries like steel, heavy machinery, etc., which are essential for the growth of industries in the 20th century. Most of the Indian goods were manufactured by the small-scale industries which were manned by individual artisans and craftsmen. But the Indian goods could not compete with the machine-made English goods, which were cheaper and more attractive. Hence, Indian crafts and handloom products, mainly the cotton and silk cloth, could not compete against the foreign goods, nor could they fare any better in foreign countries where they were burdened with higher and unjust duties. The reasons for slow growth are no proper protection. The enterprises were not given proper protection by the British government. Discouragement by British government. Only those industries in which the British government put their own capital were given encouragement. High railway freight charges. The railway freight charges were higher for locations not nearer to the ports. This proved that the transportation of the goods manufactured for the Indian markets were more expensive than goods meant for exports. Exorbitant tariffs 
the British imposed exorbitant tariffs on goods made in India. Entrepreneurs were harassed for getting licenses. Entrepreneurs were constantly harassed for getting licenses and finance to establish and run industries. No facilities for technical education. There were almost no facilities for technical education, which alone could strengthen Indian industrial entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs faced fierce competition from abroad. The Indian indigenous entrepreneurs faced fierce competition from machine-made goods exported to India from abroad. Lack of transportation and communication facilities. Lack of transportation and communication facilities acted as a stumbling block in the way of industrial growth. Discouraged the establishment of heavy industries. The British government did not encourage the establishment of heavy industries like heavy machinery, iron and steel, which are necessary for rapid industrialization. Political turmoil. Political turmoil and abolition of princely courts discouraged the growth of entrepreneurship. Multi currency system. Prevalence of multi currency system affected the business environment and blocked the growth. In spite of the above problems, the export trade of textile in the 17th century was on an ascending trend. During this period, grouping of Indian merchants into joint stock associations for the purpose of managing the supply of textiles to European companies was very significant. This helped in exporting huge volume of text sugar industry, another important industry which attained considerable proportions, was that of sugar, including Kansari. Its production in 1920 was mere 73,100 tons, which rose to 1.23 million tons in 1936. Soon, India not only became self-sufficient in sugar, but also became the largest sugar-producing country in the world. Iron and Steel Industry The iron and steel industry, one of the basic industries, had a humble beginning in the 19th century. Its production was limited to only 35,000 tons in the early years of the 20th century. A significant step was the formation of Tata Iron and Steel Company by Jamshed G. Tata in the Singhbhoom district of Bihar at Jamshedpur. In 1911, the World War I provided a big opportunity to carry out the expansion of its plants. Other industries Among the other mining industries, developed during the later half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century were those of manganese, salt, saltpeter and mica. During the same period, India witnessed the use of many other machine-based industries like cement, paper, matches, rice, floor and timber mills, leather tanning, woolen textiles, etc. Plantation Industries Indigo Plantation Industry Indigo as a dye was commonly used in textile manufacturing. The foreigners developed indigo plantation in Bengal and Bihar at the end of the 18th century. They employed Indian peasants to work on their plantations. Tea plantation industry The tea plantations were developed first in Bengal and Assam in the middle of the 19th century, 1830 to 1840. But later on, they were also developed in Himachal Pradesh in the northwest and Nilgiri Hills in the south. Coffee plantation industry Coffee plantations were developed in areas of southern India like Mysore, Korg, Kerala, etc. But all these plantations were based on exploitation. Their owners were mostly Europeans and the labourers were Indians. The working conditions of the labourers on coffee plantations were bad and they were no better than slaves. The British government did everything to help the owners of the plantations. Before their employment, the labourers had to sign an agreement. After that, no labourer could leave his service. If anybody wanted to do so, he was traced and arrested by the police. Chief features of the development of modern industries in India are Modern industries led to unemployment of thousands of craftsmen and artisans of India. They had no other alternative except to become workers in big factories. Industrial development in India was lopsided as industries were localized in a few big cities while the other parts 
remained semi-developed and undeveloped. There was no balanced regional development. There was a dominance of foreign capital. Banking too was in the hands of the British. The British monopolized the external trade too. Heavy industries were largely neglected. It created impediment for the growth of other industries too. Machinery and technology had to be imported from outside. It meant complete dependence on other countries. Plantation industry, indigo, tea and coffee etc. was wholly owned by the foreigners. The Indians were mere workers in these plantations. All the profits went to the foreigners. As such, there was a drain of wealth from the country. The British did not provide the benefits of banking, loan, insurance etc. to the Indian industries. Technical education too was lacking. As a result of industrialization, two new social classes emerged in India, the capitalists and the workers. Since their interests clashed with each other's, the gulf between the two classes widened. Industrialization gave rise to migration of population from the rural areas to the urban areas. Big cities, where the industries were largely located, began to be overcrowded due to an immense pressure on land. It created problems of housing and sanitation in the cities. The slow pace of industrialization in India resulted in the backwardness of the economy of the country. Textiles have been an important component of Indian civilization for at least 3,000 years. The discovery of several spindles and a piece of cotton stuck to a silver was revealed that the spinning and weaving of cotton was known to the Harappans nearly 5,000 years ago. References to weaving are found in the Vedic literature on the method of spinning, the various materials used, etc. The foundations of the Indian textile trade with other countries began as early as the 2nd century BC. A horde of block-printed and dyed fabrics, mainly of Gujarati origin, found in the tombs of Fostet, Egypt, are proof of large-scale Indian exports of cotton textiles to Egypt in the medieval times. In the 13th century, Indian silk was used as barter for spices from the western countries. Towards the end of the 17th century, the British East India Company had begun exports of Indian silks and various other cotton fabrics to other countries. These included the famous fine muslin cloth of Bengal, Bihar and Odisha. Painted and printed cottons or chintz was extensively used in India, China, Java and Philippines, long before the arrival of the Europeans. Before the introduction of mechanized means of spinning, in the early 19th century, Indian cottons and silks were hand-spun and hand-woven in the form of a highly popular fabric called the khadi. Fabrics that use mill-spun yarn but which are hand-woven are known as hand-loom. The traditional textile industry of India virtually decayed during the colonial regime. However, the modern textile industry took birth in India in the early 19th century when the first textile mill in the country was established at Fort Gloucester near Calcutta in 1818. The cotton textile industry, however, made its real beginning in Bombay in 1850s. The first cotton textile mill of Bombay was established in 1854 by a Parsi cotton merchant then engaged in overseas and internal trade. Indeed, the majority of the early mills were the handiwork of Parsi merchants engaged in yarn and cloth trade at home and Chinese and African markets. The first cotton mill in Ahmedabad, which was eventually to emerge as a rival centre to Bombay, was established in 1861. The spread of the textile industry to Ahmedabad was largely due to the Gujarati trading class. The cotton textile industry made rapid progress in the second half of the 19th century and by the end of the century, there were 178 cotton textile mills. But during the year 1900, the cotton textile industry was in a bad state due to the Great Famine and a number of mills in Bombay and Ahmedabad had to be closed down for long periods. The two world wars and the Swadeshi movement provided great stimulus to the Indian cotton textile industry. However, during the period from 1922 to 1937, the industry was in doldrums 
and a number of Bombay mills changed hands. The Second World War, during which textile import from Japan completely stopped, however, brought about an unprecedented growth of this industry. The number of mills increased from 178 with 4.05 lakh looms in 1901 to 249 mills with 13.35 lakh looms in 1921 and further to 396 mills with over 20 lakh looms in 1941. By 1945, there were 417 mills employing 5.10 lakh workers. The cotton textile industry is rightly described as a Swadeshi industry because it was developed with indigenous entrepreneurship and capital. And in the pre-independence era, the Swadeshi movement stimulated demand for Indian textile in the country. The partition of the country at the time of independence affected the cotton textile industry also. The Indian Union got 409 out of 423 textile mills of the undivided India. 14 mills and 22% of the land under cotton cultivation went to Pakistan. Some mills were closed down for some time. For a number of years since independence, Indian mills had to import cotton from Pakistan and other countries. After independence, the cotton textile industry made rapid strides under the plants. Between 1951 and 1982, the total number of spindles doubled from 11 million to 22 million. It increased further to well over 26 million by 1989 to 90. Today, cotton is an integral part of textiles in India. Nearly 4 million handlooms are engaged in weaving fabrics of nearly 23 different varieties of cotton. The government established the All India Handicrafts Board, All India Handloom Board, Central Silk Board and the Khadi and Village Industries Board shortly after launching the first five-year plan in 1989-90.